The piano is a beautiful instrument that allows for a wide array of beautiful playing and expression. But something most people don't know is that over 300 years ago, a precursor to the piano in some ways allowed for more intimate and expressive playing. Hi, I'm Lexa. It's great to see you. Let's make something. In today's video, we're going to be designing a type of clavichord. A clavichord is a precursor to the piano that directly connected the keys with the strings, allowing the instrumentalist to get a wah-wah type effect like guitarists play nowadays. It's an old instrument and it went out of vogue in the 1700s due to its lack of volume and several other limitations of the instrument. But in today's video, we're going to start working on a design that tries to mitigate many of those drawbacks in some cases use modern technology to do so, to get an instrument that captures that expression of the original. Let's get started. So the normal clavichord is a pretty simple mechanism. You have your key lever. Which rides on the fulcrum. The player presses down on this. There's a tangent, which is just a little metal piece, sticks up, the string runs over the top of it. When the player depresses the key, this moves up and frets the string, causing it to vibrate. When the key is released, the key lever drops, the tangent drops, and then there's felt on the string that dampens it causing the vibration to stop. The advantage of this mechanism is, is it's kind of like playing tremolo on a guitar, where you bend the string back and forth, causing it to alter the pitch, allowing for a very expressive sound. But this has a big downside, as I'm sure you can imagine, you have to be holding the keys down for it to sound. This means if you're playing a fast virtuosic passage, that works fine. But if you want to play long, lugubrious notes, you have to hold them down. And if you're going over a span of more than an octave, that's just not possible. The piano solved this by separating the string from the key. Now, I'm vastly simplifying it because the piano is an incredibly complicated mechanism. When you press the key, you have a hammer, which is a piece of felt on a rod. You press the key down, this moves up and causes this mechanism to push the hammer up. Also, the felt is up here on a damper. You press the key down, the hammer goes up, and also the damper raises. The hammer strikes the string and immediately retracts, allowing the string to vibrate freely for as long as the key is held down, or as long as the pedal's held down. When you press the sustain pedal, it causes all of these dampers to rise. So even if you release the key, the string keeps vibrating for as long as the pedal is held down. This is how you can get nice blending of your music. It's great, except for the fact that we had the trade-off. Ha we had to give up the ability to be directly connected to the string. You can't get tremolo like you can on a guitar anymore. This was kind of the choice you had, and there was the harpsichord too, which kind of had the worst of both worlds, except for the fact it was louder than the clavichord. But there was no way to get this nice tremolo effect, that intimate feel that the clavichord provided. Now, I've come up with kind of a, a mechanism that tries to get the best of both worlds. So you have your key lever on the fulcrum. The string goes against the top of it and the tangent is connected directly to the string on a tangent arm. 
And of course, this part will be dampened because you don't want the nasty little high frequency vibrations you get off of that part. Now, the way this works is you have another arm that rests right here with a linkage. You press the key lever down, this hammer rises and strikes the tangent arm, allowing for, as you change the, the, uh, the pressure on the key arm, it causes that pressure to be directly translated into the string. Now, because there is mechanical advantage, it's not going to have the same level of connection that a true clavichord would have, but you're still directly connected to it. And like the piano, you have a system of dampers which rise above the string, allowing for a sustain pedal. And of course, there's a little point here which allows the key lever to push the damper up individually as it would on a piano. Or you use the pedal. We get the best of both worlds. So now let's let's start drawing this up in SolidWorks and see how it actually looks. Okay, so I've opened up SolidWorks. This is what I'm going to be using to design it. I know that it's kind of expensive, so I'm going to include step files as well as STLs in my GitHub repo for this. And I'm going to include the links in the description. But yeah, I'm going to be doing it in SolidWorks. Feel free to follow along if you have it. But what we're going to work on first is we're going to create the key lever. So I took rough measurements off of my Korg 350 keyboard that I have. These don't have to be perfect measurements because this is mostly for a proof of concept to prove that the general design idea works. Once this is proven successful, then what we'll do is we'll circle back and have more precise measurements and work on not just one key, but look at all of the keys together in aggregate so we can include things like there's going to have to be spaces for the uh, frame of the clavichord, stuff like that. But for the time being, we're going to do rough measurements just to, to verify that the idea works. I'm going to sketch in the right plane, which basically means so I'm looking from the right side of the part. And SolidWorks, so like most CAD software, you draw out a sketch and then you perform operations on that, like extrusions or revolving. Now I'm going to make a center line, which is going to be the point of rotation that the key levers rotate around the fulcrum on this center line. And I'm going to do this kind of like how it works in a piano, where instead of using more of a modern hinge system, you have like little pins that go up with a stopper that it rotates on. Now, instead of using specialized pins, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use M3 bolts just for prototyping. And it looks kind of weird what I'm doing, but it'll make sense once I get a little further along. This cutout is going to be what it rotates around. Now I'm just going to use a nylon lock nut on that M3 bolt for it to rotate on so it'll be a cavity like this. The nut will be in the middle with the bolt protruding and that'll actually allow us to adjust the uh, z-axis on each of the keys. So now of course all this part is way too big to print on the trunk seat. So I'm going to have to split it up into pieces with Mesh Mixer when I finally do print it. The maximum angle that I can rotate, we'll just say 15 degrees. And we have a fully defined part. Um, so for those of you who don't know SolidWorks, basically, since everything is geometrically defined, when you make a sketch, before you can perform any like three-dimensional operations on it to give it actual volume, you have to make sure all of the geometry is fixed so there's no ambiguity to it. And that's what it means when it says fully defined. So now we can perform operations on it to give it three dimensions instead of being just two-dimensional like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to extrude it. And we're going to do it about the, the mid plane. What that means is extrude 
out both directions from the sketch. And since we decided seven mil is the the room we have to leave in the cavity to rotate on that nylon lock, we're going to extrude three and a half mil in each direction. And so now you can see when that goes in here, the bolt slides up to the top. We'll work on the left side because it's easy. We're going to sketch off of that plane and we're just going to draw a rectangle. Easy peasy. When I measured these, they're about 12 millimeters across at the thinnest part where they're equal, equally sized. Because each key on a piano keyboard, it's shaped a little bit differently, repeating at the octave. So, you know, if you look at, you look at a, a C, it's going to be flat on the left hand side, but then it's going to be cockeyed on the right side. And then you have C sharp, which is a little black one right above it, and so on and so forth. They're all different shapes, but at the point where they meet the fulcrum, they're equidistant and equally sized. So that's what we're going off of. And for this proof of concept, we're not going to worry about the pretty key shape at the playable end. So we know this is going to be 12 millimeters across completely. And so we take that three and a half. And so we subtract that from six. So we're left with 2.5 to extrude to the left. And there it goes. Now, this side's going to be a little bit different because we have to leave room for that the arm that actuates the dampers to go past. So we're only going to extrude out the rectangle the, the 2.5 sans 2 because we're going to leave two millimeters space for the arm to pass on the right side of the key lever. So we're going to start this the same. We're going to go sketch on the plane, view it. We're going to draw a rectangle over it. Now we're only going to extrude this out 0.5. Don't worry, there aren't going to be any geometries that are 0.5 millimeters thick. It's just to get to the next plane. So now, off of this newest plane, So this is going to be the center line of it while the key lever is flat. Set them to construction geometry and the construction geometry basically just tells SolidWorks these, these lines are for our reference. They're not going to be extruded or anything going forward. So we're just looking at basically relative to the key lever, this line rotates down at that 15 degree angle. So this is again the center line of the damper at maximum rotation. And this key will never actually rotate 15 degrees. This just gives us plenty of room just to work with. A little SolidWorks trick, if you drag from left to right, you only select what's included in the selection. If you select from right to left, you select anything the selection box touches. So that's why I went left to right, lassoed around that line just to select that one line that I'm trying to get. Now, I'm no SolidWorks expert by any means. I'm just 100% self-taught from playing around with the program. But so if any of you are like actual SolidWorks whizzes, I'm sorry, please forgive me for my noobishness. Perfect. So basically this just says, this is the minimum position of the damper rod, the maximum position of the damper rod, and then give the, the diameter of three millimeters plus 0.2 millimeters of clearance on each 0.2 all the way around. This is where we're going to put the linkage. So we're gonna punch a hole through there, but we'll use the hole tool for that. 
Now we're going to make the hole. We're using the hole tool. I know you can't see it, it's off the frame right now, but basically I'm selecting a straight hole. I'm setting the type to be screw clearance. So basically leave enough clearance around the threads of a screw. And we're using an M3 with close clearance is fine. And then the condition is through all. So basically just punch a hole all the way through. Now lastly, you need to make a little punch out for the linkage to use. Now we're going to do what's called an extruded cut. And this basically just takes this and extrudes a cut instead of extruding material. So on that sketch, we select it, do an extruded cut, mid-plane, so it extrudes. Oh, it's not letting me do it in both directions. Oh, I know the problem. I didn't close the sketch. It's a, it's an open figure. It's not, a, it's doesn't make like a closed geometric shape. And so that's why it can't extrude anything off of it. All I have to do is connect the dots. It's kind of like making an STL manifold. For those of you who have struggled with non-manifold geometry, I'm trying to print an, an STL. There we are. Now I can do it mid-plane. So we're going to go 6.4, cut that out. And there it is. If you find this video interesting and helpful, please do me a solid and hit that like button. If you want to keep track as I release future videos in this series, please subscribe. So now we're going to start working on making the hammer. Again, we're going to work from the right plane and we're going to start from its fulcrum. So we'll just punch a hole at this once it's extruded. Now we want most of the mass to be out on the head side of the hammer, just so it has the most inertia when it hits the, uh, the tangent arm. Looks good enough. Now this shape is, or this part is a lot simpler. We just have to punch this hole and then we're going to have the hammer side much wider than the uh, than the rest of the body while the hammer side and then the pointer rotates around. So we don't have to worry about making a, uh, a channel for the damper rod like we did on the key lever. Now let's extrude this. It's going to be a mid plane. Now this part, we're only going six millimeters wide for the arm component. The hammer, on the other hand, it's going to be the full 12. So I'm going to extrude out the hammer now to be the, the actual hammer component, the head of it, to be the full 12. And now the right hand side of this is going to be 6 from the center line. So this face is going to be collinear with this face but the bracket that holds this is going to come up on the left side. And of course the damper rod passes on the right side over here. Now we'll throw a little fillet on this just to kind of take a little bit of weight off of it. Now I'm going to leave this flat. We'll slice it right here so that way I can print here. Now there's, it's going to need some overhang a little bit right there, but that's okay. It, it's okay if the face isn't perfectly flat. We can always sand that down. But the bottom side, we'll throw a fillet on it. It's gonna make it look nice also. Yeah, that works fine. Okay, let's put a hole on it. Now we just need to make the uh, attaching point for the linkage. So 6.4, oh, 
Wow. Okay, that's not going to work. I'm just changing my mind a little bit about this. Okay, so I changed my mind on the dimensions a little bit. I'm going to make the rod of the hammer arm eight millimeters thick. And I'm going to change the linkage to three millimeters thick. I think that's still that's still going to be strong enough because it's 100% in compression and I'll print it flat. All we have to do is uh, we'll go in here, change this to 3.4 to get 0.2 clearance on each side. That looks like that. Now 8 mil thick. We're going to select this. We're going to do an extruded cut. Again, 3.4. Okay, now punch the hole. And I'll make a linkage now. It's going to be four centimeters from on center to on center. Now we can make the assembly. Oh wow, I did my math wrong. That looks more about right. And now that I'm seeing this, this should actually be in a resting position down here. So I'll modify that to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to make a frame to support it for when we print it and test it. So I'm in sketching in the right plane, and it's pretty simple. So this over here is going to simulate the armature that controls the, uh, the damper position. I'll go seven to the left because it's going to be from center. It's six wide for the for the widest part of the key lever and the hammer. Now we'll just import that test frame over here. That's exactly how it's supposed to go. You press the key, and the hammer goes up. Just like that. I don't want to spend too much more time on this particular design until I printed these parts out and tested them. So that's what I'll do over the next couple days. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay tuned next week if you want to see more about designing this and actually building a prototype to see if it works well. If you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and don't forget to ring the bell if you want to be notified when I release that video. Thank you all so much for watching and have a good one. Bye!